So good morning, everybody. Um, I have the honor and responsibility of introducing today's amazing plenary speaker, Dr. Ivan Magalhães. Um, but um, if you go to his Twitter profile, you'll see that Ivan proudly calls himself a spider nerd. Uh, and he's been one for a while. Uh, even during his undergrad, um, when he got a bachelor's of, in biological sciences, he was already into spiders. Uh, he completed that degree in 2010 at the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais, um, where he studied the cladistics of microthena and chitasis. I hope I pronounced that second genus right. As an undergrad. So as an undergrad, he's already doing really cool phylogenetic work. Um, and that just keeps going. So in 2013, Ivan got his master's in conservation and wildlife management from the same school. Um, but this time he worked on putting together a, the fascinating story about how Sicaria spiders diversified across South America. And I know for a fact that Ivan fell in love with this genus because his Twitter handle, six eyes, eight legs, um, is based on one of the key diagnostic traits of this uh, spider. Um, and I highly encourage you, if you haven't already, to follow him there. Um, because in addition to being an excellent uh, researcher, Yvonne is a spectacular science communicator and artist. Um, and most importantly, he makes amazing science memes. So trust me, you're gonna want to uh, check out his feed. If you haven't already noticed, um, Yvonne's spider interests are diverse. For his PhD, which he completed in 2019 at the Universidad de Buenos Aires, um, he dove into the semantics of a completely different family the Philistians. Um, and since then, his spider nerd powers have just kept growing. Uh, he's worked on the deep history of the spider fossil record, on the evolution of tracheal organs. This guy's range is, this guy's range is completely incredible. Uh, he even speaks three languages. Um, but of course, if you were at our first talk of this conference, you would know this because um, that was the Platnik Award announcement. Um, and Dr. Ivan Magalhães is our first Platnik Award awardee, and rightly so. His amazing work on the phylogenetics of so many different spider groups is what exactly I think we'd all recognize as Norm Platnik energy. Um, and so you get why when we got the nominations, we had to invite Ivan to give a plenary at this year's conference. Uh, today, he's going to take us on a journey across millions of years of spider evolution across several families. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Ivan Magalhães to the virtual stage and to his plenary talk. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian, for this very nice and detailed introduction. So I hope that uh, my talk will cover some of the topics that you mentioned. I will share my slides. Uh, can you see then okay? Okay, yeah. so uh, I'm very, very excited to be here today uh, speaking a little about my research on spider diversity and biogeography in deep evolutionary time. And as we all know, spiders are one of the most diverse groups of animals. So they are the, the single largest clade composed exclusively of predators and thus they are very important in terrestrial existence. And because they are so diverse, I think that any biogeographic synthesis that fails to account for them uh, will be incomplete. And that's why I have been trying to uncover their biogeographic patterns. Um, so in the last few years as a community, we have been making uh, great progress in establishing a systematic basis for this group. And now most major clades of spiders are well established. And in this phylogeny that you can see, um, this is probably not going to change very much upon the addition of new data. And here I highlighted some of the main clades that we will be discussing today, like my galomorphs, which are tarantulas and their kin, uh, since permiata, which, are, uh, which include dead long leg spiders and recluse spiders, uh, palpimenoids, which are a a small clade of spiders that eat all the spiders, um, araneoids, which are orb weavers and their kin, and RTA spiders, which include um, wolf spiders, jumping spiders, and related families. Um, so this, this 
lineages that are at the base of the spider tree are what we can call collectively as haplogiant spiders. They are not a monophyletic group, as you can see. And um, in these families, the females do not have elaborate external genitalia. That is opposed to intelligines, which do have uh, elaborate external genitalia in females. Uh, but haplogiant spiders, even though they are not a monophyletic group, they are very important because uh, uh, they help us understand the, the evolution of early spiders. So that is why I have been focusing mostly on, on these groups. But uh, spider diversity is not uh, distributed evenly among these clades. So here you can see a graph of the number of species per each clade. So haplogiant spiders are actually only 20% of spider diversity. So groups like mygalomorphs and synspermiata are actually fairly diverse, but palpimanoids are, are a very relictual group with less than 300 species. And the diversity is actually dominated by groups such as orbuivas with uh, around 25% of the diversity. And more than half of all spiders belong to the RTA clade. So they're actually uh, the most diverse group. But this um, relates only to current diversity. And uh, sometimes making inferences only with extant species may be misleading. So. To illustrate this, I bring the example of arcades or pelican spiders. They are these very funny looking animals that uh, only occur in Southern Africa and Madagascar and Australia. And if you look at distribution, then you're gonna say, hey, this is a Gondwanan family that originated when the Southern continents were uh, fused together many millions year, many million of years ago. But when you take a look at the fossil record of this family, all the fossils are present in the Northern hemisphere. So it actually, it was a widespread family that happened to got extinct from the north. So fossils actually help us understand uh, the current patterns of biodiversity. Uh, unfortunately, spiders are very delicate, their cuticle is very thin, and thus they will uh, preserve as fossils only in very exceptional conditions. Um, still, we know some uh, 1,400 different uh, species of fossil spiders. Here you can see some examples. Um, so on the left, he, uh, these spiders are preserved as rock compressions. Uh, they come from deposits that uh, are lake deposits with very fine sediment uh, and lack of oxygen. So the spiders could uh, preserve before decomposing. But actually, most uh, fossil spiders are preserved as amber inclusions, such as this one in the right. So in this map, you can see the geographic distribution of different fossil deposits bearing spider fossils. And you can see that uh, clearly they are concentrated in the northern hemisphere. And on this graph in the left, what you can see is that uh, this is the number of species in each of the deposits. And there are three deposits that um, clearly have much more diversity than, than the others. And they are these three ones that are highlighted uh, in red. And what they all have in common is that they are deposits that include, uh, uh, that uh, they are amber deposits. So uh, uh, these are the three ones that I was mentioning before. So they have different ages. So one of them is the, the amber deposits in Myanmar, uh, which have around, uh, which are around uh, 98 million years old. So they are, uh, they belong in the Mesozoic or the era of dinosaurs. And the other two deposits uh, are uh, of Cenozoic in, in age. So the, the amber deposits in the Baltic Sea are around 47 million years old, and the ones in the Dominican Republic are around 15 million years in age. So it's, it's, it's good because we have a, a different uh, age span for each of them. And they are hugely important because around three quarters of all described fossil spiders come from these three deposits alone. So they are um, crucial for us to understand the, the best diversity of spiders. Um, so th this is the graph that I was showing you before with the current diversity of spiders, but we could ask what about the past diversity? So have these figures always been like this or has uh, the relative diversity of the groups changed through time? And to answer this question, what we did was to um, 
take uh, the, the, the fossil species and classify them into each of these major groups to see how, uh, how, how the diversity changes through time. And this is what we got. So this graph here on the right is the exact same one that I just showed you. Uh, and the three others are different fossil deposits that are all in the Cenozoic or the current era. And what they all have in common is that uh, in both the extant uh, fauna and also in the fossil faunas of the Cenozoic, the dominant groups are RTA spiders and the runioid spiders. But when we cross to the Cretaceous or, or to the Mesozoic, we get a very different scenario. Because uh, in the Mesozoic we, and before, we have no evidence of RTA spiders being even present. And uh, Aranioids were present, but they are, very, uh, they are not very diverse. And the diversity uh, is dominated mainly by Synspermiata and Palpimanoids, uh, that, that group that is not very diverse today. So there has been a major change in diversity since the Mesozoic in the in spiders. And the reasons are still not very uh, clear. It could be related to the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. But because we have a, a very uh, large gap in the fossil record between 99 million years old and 45 million years old, we cannot currently know if this change was gradual over this time period or if it was sudden at the end of the, at, at the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. So this is an open question. And I think that uh, I showed you before that most fossil deposits are in the Northern Hemisphere, but there are some important fossil deposits in the Southern Hemisphere as well, uh, such as these lake deposits in my beautiful home country, Brazil, and also uh, in several countries of Africa and Australia and New Zealand. So I hope that when these fossil deposits become better known, this will uh, bring some new data into this question. So I showed you that um, the evolutionary history of haplogiant spiders extends well into ancient times. So uh, they were the dominant group uh, during the Mesozoic. So they, they are really, really uh, very old. And because of that, I think that they are particularly uh, suitable to test biogeographic, biogeographic hypotheses on a global scale, uh, especially those uh, related to very old events like um, continental drift leading to, to vicarians or, or the separation of, of lineages. Uh, and to illustrate this point, I bring two examples. So most of you are familiar with this family of spiders. They are lycosids or wolf spiders, and they are a group of intelligent spiders. And then wolf spiders are actually one of the most diverse families and they occur in, in every continent except Antarctica. So they are worldwide in distribution. But all, all this diversity was uh, achieved only in the last 50 million years. So uh, in geological terms, they are very recent. And for, um, this is what Earth looked like uh, around 50 million years ago. So you can see that the continents were pretty much in their current positions. So if lycosids uh, dispersed to the whole world, uh, this could only uh, mean that uh, it was not continental drift, but rather that the spiders uh, dispersed uh, uh, over the seas to reach new continents. And that makes sense because uh, lycosids are very good dispersers. They, they uh, are capable of ballooning. So um, this, this, this seems to be the pattern for them. But when we take a look at uh, a group of haplogiant spiders, such as ursolobids, um, ursolobids are, are, have a completely different natural history. They are very, very small spiders and they live in the leaf litter uh, and, and they are very poor dispersers. So each species occurs uh, typically in only one or a few localities. And their biogeography is completely different. So we have uh, each major clade uh, restricted to a single landmass, and um, their divergences are much older. So here you can see that some splits are older than 100 uh, million years. And this, these splits between the clades closely track the separation of the continents. So a completely different story than wolf spiders. And I think that many haplogiant families will, will have this kind of patterns. Um, 
So as Sebastian was telling you, I have been focusing during my studies on the systematics of these two spider groups. So sand spiders in the family Cercariid and crevice weavers of the family Philistatid. And because they are both haplogiant spiders, I, I think that they might have uh, something in common with uh, groups like Ursulobids. So sand spiders are these very, very cute creatures. Uh, they have this name because uh, they adhere soil particles to their cuticle and they also burrow themselves in the loose soil and they also cover their egg cases with sand. So uh, you can see why they have this name. And they consist of two different genera, uh, Cycarius, which occur in America, and Noxophthalma, which occur in Africa. And they are also uh, excellent models for biogeography because uh, here, as you can see, um, they are completely restricted to uh, dry habitats, such as uh, dry forests in yellow and deserts and scrublands uh, in red. So you can see that we have uh, uh, genus in the Americas and another one uh, in Africa. And they are not very diverse, only around uh, 30 species. Crevice weavers, on the other hand, are a small or medium-sized family with uh, almost 200 species in 19 genera. Uh, they are cribulate spiders, which means that they, um, they spin these uh, messy webs with dry, sticky silk. And what you can see here to the right is pretty much all of the morphological diversity of the family. They all are brown spiders that look very much one to another. Uh, which can be a nightmare for the systematists who study them, but I don't have too much time to complain about that today. I'm here to talk about their distribution. So um, this is what uh, their distribution looks like. So they occur in every continent except Antarctica, but uh, the distribution is not even in, is not even throughout the globe, because um, here you can see. Uh, a graph with the number of species plotted against the latitude. So you can see that they clearly peak the diversity around uh, 30 degrees to the north and to the south, uh, and they are not very diverse in the tropics. So uh, these areas, these latitudes, is precisely where all the deserts and, and dry areas are concentrated. So like sand spiders, they are also most diverse in arid, sub in arid subtropical areas. And another thing that they have in common is that both families originated in the Mesozoic uh, more than 150 million years ago. And because they are so old, uh, we expected continental drift to be the main explanation for transcontinental distributions in both clades. So to, to, to test this hypothesis, what we did was to estimate phylogenies for both groups using both uh, DNA sequence data and, and also morphology. Uh, and, and these uh, phylogenies were also uh, calibrated with fossils. And that's why uh, also a very rich fossil record is important for, for this kind of biogeographic studies, because this is what uh, allows us to estimate the, the, the timing of the splits between the lineages. So this is what the pattern looks like for sand spiders. As I told you, we have an American genus uh, here in green and uh, an African genus in blue. And their age of separation, it's uh, close to uh, 90 million years old or, or so. And it very closely match uh, the age when the two continents uh, start separating. So sand spiders uh, are probably a classic case of uh, continental vicariance where uh, the separation of the two lineages was, was probably uh, related to the separation of the continents. So a, a very classic example of vicariance. But what happens with crevice weavers? Well, here the story is much more complicated because they are much more diverse and they occur in many more areas. Uh, but still they behave uh, pretty well in the sense that each genus or each lineage is restricted to a single continent or one or two continents. Um, so we can see here uh, that uh, each lineage is, 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 is basically restricted to, to, to a single area. So they, they retain a lot of biogeographic signal, 
But let's take a closer look at those uh, clades where, where there, there, are there are transcontinental distributions. So this is a spider that probably most of you are familiar with. Uh, it's Cucucania hibernalis, the sulfur house spider. Uh, and they are native to um, the US and Mexico mainly. And the sister group, Sahastata, occurs uh, in Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. And here you can see that um, the estimated age of uh, separation of these two genera is around 80 million years. And this is what Earth looked like back then. So you can see that um, it could still be a case of continental vicarians if we assumed that the ancestor was widely distributed in Europe and, and Canada and North, and North America, and then it got extinct from these areas. But uh, you have to accept at least one extinction event to, to, to think that this was a vicariant event caused by continental drift. The case is similar with these other very small spiders. Uh, this one in the photo is Andoharano. It's a genus from Madagascar. And their closest relatives uh, live in the US, Mexico, uh, and the Greater Antilles in the Caribbean. And here, again, if this was caused by continental drift, then we should expect extinctions in both Africa and South America. And then you, you have to, to think uh, of two extinction events. And perhaps it would be easier to think of a single dispersal event uh, from one area to the other instead of postulating two extinction events. So, so things start getting a little bit tricky. And finally, we have at least one case where uh, it very clearly represents a dispersal event. So these spiders in the genus Lavaita are the closest relatives of Wandela and Yardiella who live in Australia. And when these uh, genera separated, Australia had been in isolation for many and many and many millions of years. So um, it, it very clearly uh, represents a dispersal event from Southeast Asia to uh, Australia around uh, 45 million years ago. And it's interesting because in Lavaita, even today, we have species that have very widespread distributions. So, each of these two maps uh, represents a single different species. And you can see that these species are hugely widespread in many islands that are thousands of kilometers apart. Some of these islands are um, oceanic in the sense that uh, they have never been connected to continents. So somehow these spiders uh, are able to cross large uh, distances using a mechanism that's still not uh, clear for us. So um, it's clear that uh, although these uh, spider groups uh, have around the same age and they also occupy habitats with similar climates, they have contrasting biogeographic patterns. So in sand spiders, we see a, a stronger sign of uh, vicarians, while in crevice weavers, we see both vicarians and, and long distance dispersal. And I think that this has something to do with the different dispersal capabilities of both spider groups. And um, we don't have a lot of natural history data um, on them to, to, to be completely sure if they, for example, balloon or not. But we can use a proxy for estimating their dispersal capability, which is the genetic diversity at the population level. So, um, this is the data that my student Pedro Martins, uh, I, I co advised him. Um, he collected on this spider from Chile, Sicarius tomisoides, and he got this very nice pattern. Uh, Chile is a very curious country because it's uh, trapped between the sea and the Andes, and it is a very narrow strip that goes on for thousands of kilometers. And this, the distribution of this species is also like that. And Pedro found this uh, very um, interesting pattern where the genetic diversity is, is highly structured into in several uh, small clades and it closely mirrors the uh, geographic origin of the specimens. So it's, uh, the, the clades are very uh, local to, 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 to particular places. 
And, and this kind of pattern is also found in all the species of the genus. So uh, this is uh, only CO1 data for, for different species, but in all cases, the, the genetic structuring is very high and it closely maps the geographic origin of the specimens. So it seems that uh, sand spiders are very lazy and they don't move around very much. Uh, they don't disperse uh, uh, long distances. Crevice weavers, on the other hand, if we take a look at the genetic diversity, uh, this is also uh, CO1 only, they, they have some uh, genetic structuring, but sometimes uh, the same clade, uh, as you can see here in purple, it will occur in areas that are thousands of kilometers apart. So they are not sand spiders in that uh, a clade will be restricted to a single area. The same clade can be uh, in many different places. Uh, this can be seen in other species as well. So uh, this is another example, uh, a new species from the Patagonia. And here we have uh, basically the same haplotype that is distributed uh, over hundreds of, of kilometers. So somehow I think that crevice weavers are dispersing longer distance, um, which does not occur in, in sand spiders. So I think that this is an, uh, the same mechanism that is happening here at the population level is what explains the different patterns at the higher phylogenetic level. And of course, when we, when we are talking about um, dispersal in spiders, we, I, at least I think first of ballooning because uh, it's a very efficient met method of dispersal where the spider uh, leaves strains of silk in the air and then gets carried away uh, through the wind, like we see here in this fantastic photo by Nick Bay. And we, I think that we, we are still uh, starting to, to relate this to, to um, biogeographic patterns. So in this direction, uh, a very nice study came out earlier this year where the authors try to uh, correlate the presence of ballooning in my galomorph families with the size of the distribution range of the species in that family. And they found that in the families where ballooning has not been recorded, the distributions tend to be smaller than in the families where ballooning has been recorded. All of, all of the species that are widely distributed occur in families where ballooning is present. But I think this, this, nice, this kind of study is very nice, but we still need more natural history data uh, for, for different families and different genera to, to see if they balloon or not, because most of the evidence is, is still anecdotal or based on field experiments with uh, low sample sizes. And, and, and for, for some families that balloon, but do so only very rarely, uh, the, the information is very scarce. So uh, perhaps this would be something that uh, can help us refining the biogeographic hypothesis. So this is what I had to tell you today. So just to summarize and, and, and the, the, the spider diversity changed a lot through time. So we had a mesozoic that, that was dominated by haplogyne spiders. And nowadays the, the fauna is dominated by uh, RTA spiders and uh, radioids. Then I showed you that uh, two spider clades with similar ages and occupying uh, similar habitats might have uh, contrasting biogeographic histories. Uh, one of them is more dominated by vicarians and the other shows signs of dispersal. And I think this is related to their dispersal mechanisms. So I think that we need more studies on natural history of spiders. Um, with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention, my colleagues and collaborators, uh, all the funding agencies, including the AAS uh, that supported part of my studies when I was a PhD student, uh, the collections that lent material, and uh, the organizers for inviting me. And I would like to thank especially the efforts into incorporating our Latin American colleagues into the society and into the meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that amazing talk, Ivan. That was so cool. I think if we have time, I will be happy to take some questions. 
we did have a few questions in the chat that I will uh, scroll up and pass on to you. Um, let's see here. Okay, one question uh, from Sue asks, uh, is the predominance of fossils in the Northern hemisphere thought to be at all an artifact of more research uh, happening there? Is it just like where we've put our efforts as scientists? Well, I think partly yes, but I also think that um, the, the three deposits that, um, that I mentioned, uh, the one from um, Dominican Republic, the one from Baltic, the Baltic Sea, and the one from Myanmar, they are, they are really uh, spectacular. So, so they happen to be in the northern hemisphere. But I mean, for the smaller ones, perhaps, perhaps it's, it, it could be a bias in the research. Um, so uh, I also showed you that there are some uh, deposits in the south that are understudied. So I think that uh, uh, this is in part an art artifact, but it, 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 uh, it is also a biological reality. Uh, a similar question about um, kind of the fossil record. Uh, Sarah Rose asks, do you think there would be any bias based on spiders that would be more likely to get trapped in amber based on their hunting strategies or their ecology that we need to take into account when like assessing the fossil record? Oh, yes, there, there are a lot of, of biases that need to be taken into account. Um, but for instance, in the case of amber, the size is very important because a large spider uh, can get a leg trapped into the amber, but it, it will not be engulfed into the, the, the resin. So amber will, will mostly preserve uh, small size specimens. And of course, uh, most likely the, the spiders that are likely to be crawling on the, on the surface of the trees. So uh, it's, it's, it's not as common to, to get soil spiders there. And, and this, is, this is partly reflected in the, in, the, in the graphs that I showed you because if you can see here, uh, there is a difference between extant spiders and the fossil deposits in the Cenozoic. So uh, RTA spiders are less well represented in the, in the, in the fossils. And this is mainly because RTA spiders are very common in, in the soil, but not walking on the trees, not, not as much. So yes, there, there are some bias that need to be taken into account when, when you do this kind of analysis. That's fascinating. Um, I, I just want you to know that I, just as a measure of how much everyone loved this talk, it is very difficult to find the questions because I have to endlessly scroll through literally everyone saying how much they love the talk. Uh, but I did finally make it to the next question. Uh, Prashant Sharma asks, uh, the, gene, the genera Kukulkania and Sahastada, um, it's thought that in the southeastern U.S., um, or that the southeastern U.S. was formerly part of tropical Gondwana. Uh, what does the ancestral area reconstruction tell us about diversification, diversification within these two genera? And is there a clear biogeographical area of origin for each of those two? Yes, I mean, the, the ancestral area that is reconstructed for this pair is, is an area that is composed by uh, North America and Africa or North America and Africa and Arabia. But at the time that, that, that the two um, connected, that, that, that the two genera diverged, the areas were not connected. So uh, we have to take this this um, this uh, reconstruction with care because, I mean, the, the the ancestor could be distributed over this whole area and this area only if we assume the dispersal event from one area to the other, or it could be uh, distributed in North America and Africa and Europe, but the program will very rarely, rarely uh, infer extinctions because it has a cost for, for the likelihood of the, of the model. So it, it, it's tricky. You have to think of what the program is giving you, but also try to interpret the data, especially taking into account that it is known to, 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 to 
underestimate extinction events. That's why I, I try to look at the maps and discuss this, because if we only take what the program is giving you, you will get something like this, and you know that the contents were not connected, so it doesn't make too much sense.